Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Tony Cully Foster. I have the honor of being the President and CEO of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Welcome. Delighted to see you all here tonight because our topic tonight is one of the great challenges that the world faces in its 21st century. It's not just impacting our lives, it's going to impact the lives of all who come after us. That legacy weighs heavily on me. I have children, like many of you in the room, and I hope that the world that they grow up in will show more responsibility with regard to the importance of the issue of climate change and climate control than we have to date. We've done a hell of a good job of trying to destroy the planet, and I'm being objective when I say that. I'm not someone who's speculating about the science. I think there's ample evidence of the fact that uh, this challenge is one that must be faced not just by the United States, not just by our allies, but by the entire world, particularly the developing world. So we've got experts here tonight who are going to share with us their perspectives. It's my hope that they will argue with each other when they're up there on that uh, stage. It's my hope that they will stick to the facts and stay clear of hyperbole. The fact that I'm an Irishman coming out with that statement <laughs> says I'm a bold man. So it's my honor to introduce our moderator tonight, first of all, Daniel, or as he prefers to be called sometimes, Daniel uh, Fiori. Daniel is the director of the Center for Environmental Policy, School of Public Affairs at American University. And uh, Daniel has got a distinguished background on this subject. He has a reputation for being a mild-mannered but firm moderator. In the middle is Kathleen Kelly. Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress and on the Advisory Board of the Clean Energy Leadership Institute. Phenomenal background on this topic. And then Ruth Greenspan Bell, who denies any relationship <laughs> to Chairman Greenspan. We have in Ruth, Kathleen, and Daniel three people who care passionately about the topic that's under discussion tonight. The World Affairs Council is dedicated to being an institution, global education, international affairs, global communications, where learning happens. That's our ethos. So you tonight have come to teach as well as to listen. When our panel has concluded its remarks, you will have an opportunity to ask whatever questions you want in our independent and neutral forum. I encourage all of you to do so. Take this opportunity where you have people who've got enormous experience on global stages about this global issue. So get up, go to the microphones when it's over, and ask your questions. Dan will make sure that you get factual answers. Okay? So with that, I'd like you to join me in a round of applause and thanks for our distinguished panel and moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you Tony, for that very factual introduction. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us, everybody. So our, our format is that I will uh, give a little, do a little bit of stage setting on, on climate change, particularly looking at um, the international status, but linking it to what's going on in the United States. And then we'll hear some uh, opening remarks from Kathleen and Ruth, and then we will discuss some different topics and then uh, bring you into the conversation with some questions. 
So there are really four points I just wanted to, to bring in, and most of you are familiar with the issue of climate change, which is, of course, extremely complex. In the public policy field, we have this concept called wicked problems. Wicked problems are multifaceted and ever-changing and not really amenable to any actual solution. You, you sort of manage them and learn as you go, and I think this is the ultimate uh, wicked problem, the, also the ultimate uh, collective action problem, uh, so that no one country can solve the problem on its own. There are incentives for countries to be free riders in any agreement, so it's a very challenging issue in governance. So we all know that the consequences of climate change are profound, rising sea levels, extreme weather, droughts, <laughs> impacts on agriculture and biodiversity, impacts on human health. Um, we know that it, although it may involve short-term economic costs, the long-term costs of not dealing with the consequences of climate change are very profound, and the Stern Review and a number of other studies document that very clearly. Um, people in the security community recognize climate change as a source of instability, a threat multiplier in their terminology. It's a potential source of conflict around the globe. Uh, and now we're turning more and more to dealing with adaptation, but that doesn't mean that mitigation is still not on the table, and certainly international agreement following Kyoto is, is very critical. Um, in terms of what's happened internationally, my, our experts are here and they will talk about this, but I think we can sort of trace Kyoto back to the 1992 UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the, the parent agreement that later led to the Kyoto Agreement in 1997, which entered into force when enough countries signed on in 2004. An important aspect, of course, is that it, it involved binding commitments, but only from the industrialized country, the so-called Annex I country. So, from here on out, the question is, what about other countries, which of course are uh, tremendous sources of emissions? So I think that there's a lot that has been learned and perhaps accomplished. We'll hear more about that from Kyoto. But at this point, the question is, what do we do next? So we're in 2015, and the, the basic agreement expired a few years ago. So do we, do we continue with this model? Do we look for new models, uh, new ways of approaching these issues? That really is the subject of our conversation. Third, um, in, in the U.S., most people would, would say that um, if you look, you have to look at a state and local level to see a lot of progress in the United States on climate change. A number of cities are very aggressive. California, if California were a country, it would be among the uh, leaders globally on climate change. However, in the last couple of years, uh, the Obama administration has been doing many things to advance the uh, climate action agenda through the President's Climate Action Plan. So we have far more stringent fuel economy standards coming online, uh, more renewable energy investment, more renewable energy on federal lands, lots of new building and appliance standards, and of course, very controversial, but I think very important um, standards coming from EPA that would apply to new coal-fired power plants, plants being built in the future, and that would also uh, impose a number of requirements via uh, targets for um, fossil fuel reduction in states through the Clean Power Plan. And of course, the, uh, something that will come up in our remarks is the uh, President's, the administration's agreement with China, where the U.S. committed to a 26 to 28 percent reduction from 2005 levels by 2025, and China committed to stabilizing emissions around 2030, maybe earlier, and to considerably um, increasing uh, renewable energy production in China. So it's an important time, as Tony said, it is an absolutely critical issue, of profound consequences for coming generations, so thanks for joining us. So we'll start out um, with some opening remarks, first from Kathleen and then from Ruth, and then we will start our conversation after that. Kathleen. Great. Thanks, Dan, for those opening remarks, and thank you to the World Affairs Council for hosting this very timely discussion. It's really great to be here with you all. I wanted to start out by saying that this is really a historic moment right now in the international climate debates. The next seven months, countries have an actual momentous opportunity to really put the world on a low carbon economic development pathway. There's been a number of major commitments that countries around the world have made that will influence actions over the next seven months as we lead toward the international climate negotiations that will take place in Paris at the end of this year in December. 
The first thing that um, countries have committed to do is to lock in at this Paris uh, negotiation a new legally binding global climate agreement. So this is a big um, movement in the international debate. The second thing countries have committed to do is to try to stabilize or prevent warming uh, from exceeding 2 degrees Celsius, which is equivalent to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, to really avoid catastrophic climate change or the worst effects of climate change. And this is driven by uh, what the scientists around the globe are telling us uh, about climate change. And lastly, countries have committed to announce over the next seven months new action plans that they'll implement domestically to reduce their emissions. Fortunately, there are all sorts of technologies available and cost-effective policies also available to help countries really move toward a low carbon development pathway and shift away from fossil fuels and more toward renewable energy and energy efficiency to really drive the global emission reductions that we need to meet uh, the two degree goal. And these technologies and policies bring all sorts of other benefits, not just for the climate change, but uh, for climate, but they also help to reduce health care costs, for example. They can reduce the growing costs that we're already seeing to respond to extreme weather events and to recover from disasters. Um, they also can help to improve uh, the way we use energy, to improve our energy efficiency and reduce our energy costs over time. So lots of, lots of benefits um, to uh, implementing really strong climate protection policies. There's been a number of really major breakthroughs in the international climate change policy talks um, since um, November, really, over the last six months. And, and Dan alluded to uh, one of them. The U.S. and China jointly announced in November uh, their actions um, to cut greenhouse gas emissions. And this was really kind of a game changer in the international climate talks. Historically, China and other major developing countries have really been opposed to committing to actions to cut their emissions. They really wanted uh, the developed countries to lead the way. And in Ky the Kyoto Protocol, for example, uh, really focused on securing mandatory emission reduction commitments from developed countries alone. The fact that China uh, announced together with the United States its plans to cut emissions, and these are very ambitious plans, as, as Dan mentioned, the goal to peak emissions by 2030. Uh, and to even do it sooner if possible, and to increase renewable energy in the country so that it uh, equals 20% of the total energy mix. This is really game changing and is gonna require major uh, structural changes and economic changes in China to really shift away from coal toward a cleaner energy future. And on the U.S. Um, part, Dan mentioned that President Obama committed the United States to reducing emissions 26 to 28 percent uh, below 2005 levels by 2025. This is also a very ambitious target for the United States. It's going to require us to double the amount of emission reductions that we're already achieving, and it's also going to put us on track to reduce emissions by 80% uh, below 2005 levels by 2050. So really an ambitious move um, by the president. There's been a number of other major announcements uh, recently from countries around the globe um, pledging to cut their emissions. The EU has pledged to uh, reduce its emissions collectively across all 28 members of the European Union uh, by at least 40% by 2030. Mexico has also put an ambitious target on the table along with Switzerland, Norway, and a few others. Lastly, there's been some major pledges of climate change financing. Uh, there's, there was a fund that was created, the Green Climate Fund, um, to allow developed countries to invest in developing countries uh, to help them really shift toward a low carbon and climate resilient uh, economic development pathway. And the United States has pledged $3 billion for this fund and uh, collectively there's been a, a total uh, of $10 billion uh, pledged towards this fund. So these are some major, um, major developments uh, and accomplishments in the international talks.
Uh, nonetheless, there are some significant hurdles despite this, this progress. For example, in the United States, we still um, see a lot of political opposition, especially from Republicans in Congress, to action on climate change. Sadly, 70 percent of uh, Republicans in the Senate do not believe that climate change is, is real. They either deny um, the facts of climate change or they, they question the science behind climate change. And this is in the face of overwhelming evidence that climate change is in fact real. We're already seeing the impacts and it's already causing uh, severe weather, droughts, floods, and extreme storms. And the other challenge is that um, uh, Republicans in Congress are also working to block a major aspect of uh, President Obama's climate change action plan, and that's EPA's Clean Power Plan. And that is a, a, a key piece of uh, regulation that the President is going to need to meet the emission reduction commitments. Another um, big challenge that we see um, in the international climate talks is even though we're seeing uh, commitments from, uh, from countries uh, to reduce their emissions, uh, we are still very far away from reducing emissions to a level where we're actually in line to meet the two degree goal um, that, that scientists have stated we really need to, to meet. And um, so there's, there's likely going to be an ambition gap in the Paris Agreement. And so what this means is that um, the, the collective emission reduction targets in Paris are not likely going to add up to what we need to meet the two degree goal. So we're going to need to include in the Paris Agreement very, a very strong process for reviewing those targets over time and for requiring countries to really um, strengthen the ambition of those targets over time. I'll just end on, on saying um, a few things that I, I feel hopeful about in the international uh, climate change uh, negotiations. I think, you know, first off, uh, despite the political opposition that President Obama is, is um, facing uh, with Republicans on the Hill, I think he still does have a lot of authority to act on climate change just using um, executive action or executive authority and, and that includes um, his authority to both enter into international or multilateral agreements um, and also authorities through EPA and other agencies to reduce emissions. So, um, so there's still opportunity to, to cut emissions in the United States and for action. Um, also, there's just a handful of very affordable policies that are available to countries around the world, and if they were implemented widely, they would really take us a long, long way to uh, achieving the emission reductions that we really need to stabilize warming at two degrees Celsius. And those um, policies include you know, massive um, improvements in the efficiency of our vehicles and our buildings and to eliminating fossil fuel subsidies and to creating uh, significant incentives to invest in renewable energy. And as I said before, there are all sorts of benefits that, that come along with these policies, uh, reducing health costs, energy costs, and also driving a low carbon economic development around the globe. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Um, I'm going to build on uh, what Kathleen has said, uh, but I'm going to take it in a slightly uh, different direction and a different kind of framework for how you think about what's going on uh, in Paris coming up and the UNFCCC process. I'm going to start with what I think is good news, and that is that I believe that the climate policy world seems to be emerging from a long period of kind of magical thinking. Um, and I think for a long time, doctrine was favored over pragmatism. And people were out there looking for silver bullets. They're looking for some big, you know, single solution to this big problem. Um, so, for example, the UNFCCC, the United Nations uh, Framework Convention, bought the economist's argument in Kyoto that market instruments, emissions trading, could be implemented worldwide and would work. And there was a lot of reason to believe that was a very, very big bet. Um, and the problem is that Kyoto Protocol isn't working and we've lost a lot of time uh, trying these kind of remedies. So where I think we're moving is toward what I called silver buckshot. Um, <laughs> and I think it's a much more realistic approach for energy consumption because think about energy. This is about how we use energy, right? Climate change is about how human beings use energy. 
And we use energy in every part of our lives. We use it sleeping and we use it waking. It's used maybe a little differently in the developed world and, the, and what we used to call the developing world. But that's what it's all about. It's about how we use energy. And so there can't be a single solution to that. In fact, a lot of how we use energy is just habitual. We don't even think about it. So we do the things that are easiest for us to get through the day without thinking about the bigger consequences of it. And I can talk about that more later because it frames another part of the work I'm doing we can talk about in the Q&A. So this, the silver bullet mindset to me is like sort of, you know, putting all your retirement savings into a single stock. I'm not talking about a single mutual fund or a single index fund. I'm talking about a single stock, and that's kind of what we've done with the UNFCCC. So I've been working on two areas, two approaches that, you know, to kind of a buckshot approach, and I want to just talk about one of them today. Um, a few years ago, actually about five years ago, uh, I started doing some work with, uh, with uh, Barry Blackman, who's at the Stimson Center and who is an arms control expert. We, we started uh, looking, we were trying to think about are there other models for how you might get to some form of agreement on, on uh, greenhouse gas emissions beyond sort of the, the UNFCCC framework model, which is a model of trying to solve an awful lot of problems in a single agreement with 196 parties in the negotiations, you know, just in some ways a prescription for chaos. Um, and the, the model we came up with, and I want to be very clear that this is not a template, this is not like a paint by numbers kind of model, but this is a set of ideas to think about other ways of approaching and managing this pretty pretty big problem. So the, the, one we, the one that seemed the most promising, and we looked at an awful lot of other um, uh, ways that international problems have been handled, trade, uh, human rights, a lot of other ways, was interestingly the weapons world. The effort to try to control nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction. So if you look at that history of that, of that process. Coming out of World War II, there were two decades of UN negotiations, negotiations within the UN to try to place all nuclear materials and facilities under UN control. And, and the goal was general and complete disarmament, a very lofty and idealistic goal, one, frankly, that we still sign on to. I mean, the President has signed on to it within the last few years. But what I think is interesting is that after these two years of, two decades of kind of struggling with this huge, huge, probably unsolvable problem, the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. And the Cuban Missile Crisis was a real wake-up call. It basically said, you know, there could be an, a nuclear catastrophe. Uh, these weapons could be thrown at each other and things could go really wrong. And at that point, the negotiate or the world started stripping issues off and dealing with and finding smaller issues that could be resolved in, in a, you know, kind of a real time frame. And so the first thing that happened was uh, the, the uh, 1963 agreement that um, limited atmospheric, banned atmospheric testing and certain testing uh, uh, under the oceans. And one of the reasons why it was possible to do this at that point was the technology existed for monitoring. So when countries signed up to this, they could feel reasonably comfortable that the other countries signing up to this would, would meet their obligations, and if they didn't, there were ways of catching them and finding out whether or not they did. Um, this was the beginning of a process of peeling off issues and, and, and setting out various agreements on various pieces of the problem. Um, there was a non-proliferation treaty and only 18 countries signed on to that until the U.S. and the Soviet Union decided that agreement was necessary after China in 1964, a very, very poor country, started exploding 
atom bombs and showed that it had the capacity and the skills to do that. So that actually concentrated people's minds pretty quickly and, and, and they were able to conclude this agreement. Um, France and China stayed out, but eventually they signed up to this. Um, before completion of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, it was thought that there would be 25 nuclear powers by the end of the 20th century, and at that point and today, there's still only nine. That doesn't mean it's not a problem. That doesn't mean we don't still worry about North Korea, Pakistan, rogue nations, but the point is, by taking these issues down to smaller units and breaking them out, they were able to make some progress. And here's what's really important when you do that. When you do that, you can develop, start developing trust among countries that you can work together, that you can achieve something, and you can build on that trust. So when the UN General Assembly ceased being a good venue for these problems, um, it, there was a shift to a committee on disarmament, and that committee produced the Biological Weapons Convention, the Chemical Weapons Convention, and the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban. But then that committee went into paralysis, in fact, in large part because of Pakistan's intransigence. Um, so there was a movement to regional configurations. And around the globe now, there are a series of regional conf 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 configurations of nuclear-free zones. Um, the other important thing, thing to think about is bilateral negotiations. Remember that the two biggest possessors of these weapons were the United States and the Soviet Union, right? Well, over the years, the United States and the Soviet Union engaged in lengthy communication, negotiations, uh, cooperation of various kinds, and, and over time this reduced the overall number and size of the arsenals. It established communication channels. It avoided accidents. It outlawed classes of missiles, and over time, this is th probably the most interesting part of it, each of the countries built a level of trust that they were able to agree to greater intrusiveness one with the other in terms of inspections and, th and, and monitoring and measures for verification. So that built because they had started from a limited base and they've moved on and, and, and broadened their relationship through levels of trust. Now, we, we can't pretend this was an even process. We can't pretend there was, it, was always, it was always happy. And right now, we're worried about you know, uh, Putin and uh, certain intentions he has with respect to weapons. But the point is, if you don't get things moving, you never, you know, if, if you're always insisting on solving the entire problem at once, uh, you may just end in this sort of Groundhog Day kind of um, uh, ethos that we're in right now in the UNFCCC. Finally, and I won't go on to too much longer, uh, these, they were able to create these really interesting subsidiary bodies. The International Atomic Energy Agency uh, started off monitoring peaceful nuclear facilities over time because it was a highly competent organization. Trust developed. It was able to increase the inspections it, and the kind of inspections it did. It added additional protocols, including inspections of undeclared suspected facilities on a challenge basis. Um, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization is still provisional. It's connected with a treaty that still hasn't been ratified, and yet it has functioned very competently and built a global network of sensors showing that verification is, is something that's possible. So the bottom line is, look, we haven't eliminated nuclear weapons, but we've stabilized things. So what are the lessons for climate? I mean, I think they're pretty obvious, and it, you, can, you can get them from without me drawing them out. But going back to the earlier point, it has to do with, growing, with pragmatism and problem solving. The UNFCCC sets out a vision of what we would like to see in the world, but there can be all alternative ways of achieving the vision. The biggest emitters are the U.S., China, and, and the European Union. Uh, why, aren't, why not work together to 
to solve that problem, and the U.S.-China agreement, in my view, is a major step um, along that way. It doesn't solve the problem for all time, but it, by sitting down and saying we can work together on this and we can mutually commit to uh, steps to move things forward, that's huge. I mean, that is really, that's more important than the actual agreement, in my, in my opinion. And the, U, the U.S. and India are working together on alternative energy uh, matters. Now, you don't always have to call it climate, you know, and there are a lot of ways around this. It's, as Kathleen alluded to, you know, it's, it's about dealing with the emissions levels, but it's also about building up um, uh, alternative energy sources and thinking about all the myriad problems that this is all about. Um, there's this, uh, a coalition on uh, these short-lived forcers, black carbon, methane, 30 countries plus non-state partners are working on this issue very productively. Uh, that's a very big issue. It doesn't have to be, you know, 196 parties because it's, it's more containable. Um, HFCs, that's something that, you know, we're trying to solve through the Montreal product protocol. Uh, Paris is predicated on individual pledges of countries, um, and it's apples and oranges, and it's hard to sort out and hard to take care, hard to keep track of. But these are commitments that countries are making, and that's it seems to me the really important part of that. So I'm going to stop by saying I think that we in this world of climate change can be more creative, we can be more opportunistic, and I think actually that's the way things are going and I'm extremely happy about it. Okay, well thank you both for those remarks. Maybe we uh, have a number of questions I'd like to ask, but go back to Kathleen. So Kathleen, I would say you sounded sort of cautiously optimistic, but maybe that's too, too much on the optimism side about where we are. We get really a, a different model, a different approach um, to, to dealing with climate change inter issue internationally. I just wondered what you thought of that approach. Is it, is it time to maybe change towards something that is more incremental, more opportunistic? So just your thoughts mm -hmm. on that approach. Great. Um, thanks. I, I, I do tend to be optimistic, and, and Tony, maybe that's my Irish heritage. Um, yeah. But um, I also think you have to be an optimist to, to work on this issue. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is a very big issue. This is a uh, a tremendous global challenge. You know, it cuts across um, every sector, every country. You know, the consequences of unchecked climate change are huge. You know, tr very big uh, implications for developing countries, in particular, uh, in terms of um, food price um, spikes uh, driven by droughts. You know, um, migration or displacement of people because of extreme weather events and flooding. Um, global sea level rise that you know really puts all of our coastal communities around the globe at risk. And this is a very um, big problem. So to get up and work on it every day, I think you need to be um, optimistic. But you also need to be pragmatic. And I think you know Ruth's remarks were, um, speak to a real uh, pragmatic approach. I think you know the um, the reality going into the Paris negotiations is that. Um, we have this two degree um, Celsius goal um, to limit warming to two degrees. And um, the fact is countries are likely to only commit to about half of the emission reductions that we need um, to really reduce emissions in line with this two degree goal. And so um, we're, we're going to lock in some really strong commitments uh, in Paris, uh, hopefully on both emission reductions and financing, but there's no question about it. Um, we've got a long road ahead after Paris, and what happens after Paris is tremendously um, important. I think um, there, and that is in terms of reviewing the commitments that have been made, holding countries accountable to their emission reduction pledges and their financing commitments for developing countries uh, and to, you know, reviewing the, the commitments and really putting pressure on countries over time, over the coming years, to really strengthen the ambition um, of their, both their financing and their emission reduction pledges. I think, uh, you know, I am feeling optimistic about um, the approach that, that Ruth has just laid out. Um, on the one hand, you know, moving forward as best as we can with the UN 
uh, climate negotiation process. I think that is an important process that, that needs to continue. I know after um, the Copenhagen negotiations in 2009, there was a flurry of, um, you know, kind of articles and, and a lot of debate about, oh, well, is the UN really too broken to actually um, be useful at all? And I think um, countries quickly realize that, you know, there are problems in the UN. The process is moving too um, slowly and it is hampered by politics, but it, there is some incremental progress. Uh, is it enough? No, um, but it's it's progress that we need uh, that we we re really need to continue uh, to lock in. So I think moving ahead as as um, best and as fast as we can through the UN um, process, while at the same time looking to any and all other forums um, that lend themselves to locking in um, commitment and action on climate change. And you know, Ruth mentioned a couple. Um, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, um, the 30 countries, you know, coming together to to look at short-lived um, forcers of climate change. Um, there's the Major Economies Forum, uh, which I believe is 17. The 17 major economies uh, meet regularly to have kind of off-the-record uh, political conversations about the climate negotiations in the UN context to move those forward, but also to commit to actions um, to reduce emissions. Um, I think there are you know, other economic forums, um, the G7, for example, um, at the last G7 meeting, the, the communique um, really highlighted the, the security implications of climate change uh, and the, the risks, the threat multiplier that climate change is, is causing. Um, in the G20 context, um, countries have committed to phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. I think we've, uh, and that was a commitment that was made in Pittsburgh several years ago under the, the leadership of President Obama. I think um, we haven't made as much progress as we really need to on that commitment, um, but nonetheless it is an important political commitment and I think in the context of the G20 there's talk about re-upping um, that commitment. And the last, the last forum I'll mention is the Arctic Council which is probably a, a forum that not, not many people um, know about, but it's about to be you know, a big focus of um, the news this week. Secretary Kerry uh, is taking on the, the chairmanship of the Arctic Council um, starting this Friday at a, meet, a ministerial meeting in Canada. Um, the United States is, is an Arctic nation, um, Alaska kind of straddling the Arctic Circle, um, and there are eight Arctic nations that, um, that form the Arctic Council. This is actually a, a really historic opportunity for Secretary Kerry uh, as the chair of the Arctic Council to really highlight the, um, the really dramatic changes that we're seeing in the Arctic which is warming twice as fast as the rest of the planet, and to also really push forward on action uh, to reduce emissions from not only the eight Arctic nations, but the observer countries that include China, India, and a number of other nations uh, in Europe and elsewhere. I'll stop there. So I, I think you're, <coughs> you're both talking about a process that would take this big complicated problem um, the, the, from the silver bullet to the silver Buckshot. What's the, buckshot. buckshot, yes, right. So um, breaking the smaller pieces, looking at different kinds of institutions and forums and processes mm -hmm. for advancing at different kinds of strategies at different levels and so on, and perhaps linking it with economic and security issues mm -hmm. where perhaps there, there's more traction. So I'm wondering, um, what does this mean for the domestic politics? Does this make the domestic politics easier, more difficult? Does it sort of change the the tenor of what's happening in our own debate. I just read something recently on a list of big public policy issues. Uh, climate change was the most polarizing issue on the list. So it's a, it's, it, it's a tough issue, but um, what are the implications? Do you want me to take that? Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if you break it up, that it allows you to talk about this problem in different ways. Um, and you don't always have to use the climate word, okay? I mean, if the climate word is polarizing or troubling to people, there are lots of other things you can talk about. I mean, just to, just to give an analogy in China, okay? Um, China has a lot, of, a lot of climate issues. I mean, it's a big coal user and, and very, anyway, there are lots of problems. I think what's going to drive China domestically is 
something that's not really related to climate, which is pure, you know, can you breathe in China? I mean, Chinese these days travel, okay? They travel a lot, and they go to places where they can breathe, and then they have to come home again. And um, in fact, some of that is intentionally to go to places to breathe. Um, and and they're starting. And China cares more about stability than almost anything. The Chinese government, and so they're going to address these issues. They're going to start figuring out ways to provide that energy without using coal. They're going to work on issues that reduce particulate and and all that, and that will, I believe, have some you know climate benefits. So you, they may not, they may not talk about it as a climate issue. They may talk about it as a different issue. And I think if you break, domestically, if you break the issue up, I think it also has that potential, too. Um, I mean, we can think of a bunch of examples. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, it's always easier if you have a big problem to break it up into smaller <laughs> pieces and make progress on it. And I think if we can do that domestically, we're, yeah. we're much better off. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kathleen, what are yeah, your thoughts I on that? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think um, when you talk about the security uh, implications of climate change and how uh, it is actually, you know, increasing um, the instability in already unstable regions around the world, I think you're just broadening the conversation to a larger community. It's not just the, the climate change um, advocates or energy policy makers that you're talking to, but you're bringing in um, the um, security and the defense community. You're bringing in uh, the foreign policy community. And that just allows for uh, a richer, uh, d more diverse conversation um, that opens up all sorts of possibilities in terms of solutions. So I think, you know, politically, that it is, um, it would be very helpful to, you know, expand the debate into some of these other forums. Um, I think, you know, just today actually I was struck there was a report that was released by a coalition of insurance companies and their report really highlighted the uh, skyrocketing costs of um, disaster recovery in the United States and really talked about the need for uh, smart management of our climate change risks uh, and, you know, upfront disaster risk management and building the resilience of climate, of, of communities to the reality that the climate is changing. And that opens up the conversation also to um, solutions on reducing emissions as a, as a need to reduce the risks of climate change. Um, so I think, you know, um, bringing in these other voices, including the business sector, is important. And then one last thing I'll say on the, um, the domestic politics is um, ABC and the Washington Post um, did a, a recent poll um, where they discovered that 59% uh, of Americans really want to elect uh, a candidate for president who is committed to taking action on climate change. And uh, we've already seen, um, as Secretary Hillary Clinton has announced her campaign, um, she has um, making climate and energy a key priority, uh, along with uh, a focus on um, elevating or, or supporting small businesses and helping working families. So I think this is a conversation that um, you know there is going to continue in the in the domestic context. I, um, a couple of years ago, I used a book by the, the sociologist Anthony Giddens in a, in a class. And his view was that the, the Kyoto process, where you get all these countries all around the world in this huge um, multilateral process and get binding commitments, was not going to get anywhere. He, uh, very much what we're, we're hearing now. Uh, and that the solution was to get the really big sources, the big hitters, mm -hmm. like US, China, the EU was already pretty effectively engaged and get something going from that perspective, and then you can bring other countries along. Um, so that, I think, uh, he argued that point of view as well. So I'm wondering, Ruth, what about getting uh, emerging, developing economies involved? A big issue with Kyoto in the US, of course, was that China, India, uh, a lot of the more rapidly growing uh, economies didn't have commitments, mm -hmm. whereas the industrial nations did, and so why should the US commit? Um, how, how do you get through, through the approach you're suggesting or any other approach, how do you sort of get those economies, who are going to account for the, the big gains in emissions in coming decades, more engaged? Well, I mean, 
You know, first of all, this goes back to the fact that we've been negotiating this for decades, and life has changed, and the world has changed during that time period. So, yes, when we were first negotiating this in 19, you know, and Rio was signed in 1992, um, you could legitimately say that China and India were struggling, and several other countries were struggling, uh, developing world economies. Um, now China in particular and increasingly India are engines, you know. So the life has changed and the problem with sticking with the UNFCCC formula is the formula doesn't fit the reality of where we are now. And so, but I think, and we seem to be, and so there was tremendous fighting about blame and, you know, a lot of, um, Concerns about you know who's a victim and who's and who's victimizing and it, that we lost a lot of time in all that, um, um, perhaps inevitably because of the formula that Kyoto was using. Um, I think, uh, at the risk of repeating, that the the better way is to sort of go in the back door these days, um, and you know now I think I, you know I talked about China before. Uh, turns out the air in, in Delhi is worse than the air in Beijing these days. And uh, India has a rising uh, and powerful middle class, getting more powerful. And I, they're going to have to be responsive to that. I mean, I did some work a number of years ago looking at uh, air pollution issues in, in Delhi and some homegrown solutions to that, which actually worked a number of years ago. Then they were overtaken by... Uh, growing numbers of cars and and a lot of development, but I think the tools are there and sometimes the commitment is there and we can help. You know, it's interesting. Um, Prime Minister Modi is really interested in solar, um, and I think that's been the basis of some of the discussions, right, uh, with him. And um, I think what I said earlier: let's be opportunistic. If we see an opportunity there, if if Mr. Modi is interested in solar, uh, even if he doesn't want to talk about the big climate issue, and even if he may, s a lot of the people there may still be stuck in this notion of, well, you know, you developed and we were, we didn't, and now we need to develop. Where it's it's a never-ending and un and a debate that can never be concluded. Okay, but if you can go in the side door or the back door on other types of relations and other ways of addressing these issues, I think you can actually make some real progress. And I think that's what we're, I think that's what this administration is doing. And I just want to say one thing about the polling issues, which are very, very interesting. Um, I was trained up by a smart person to understand that uh, a national poll is meaningless to particular congressmen and senators. They want to know what people in their own district. So if you say, you know, 100, you say 60 percent of Americans think we should be acting on climate right now, um, they want to know, well, what are the percentages in my district and how's that going to affect my reelection? Mm -hmm. um, but, but now when you have a presidential election coming up, those figures do make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I think we saw that last week in New Hampshire with Jeb Bush, who actually made one of the stronger statements he's ever made about climate change being real, a little bit fudging about whether it's caused by human beings or not. But, you know, we're making some progress there, and I think it is because, in part, because if he really does want to be president, he's got to be addressing the entire U.S. of A. in that process. And the entire U.S. of A. cares about this issue. They may not think it's the highest priority issue yet, but they care about it, and they want something done about it. Okay, Kathleen, any thoughts on engaging other countries before we Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, Ruth, you, you talked about um, this uh, historic precedent that was set by the UN uh, process in, on the climate negotiations where, and it was really locked in in Kyoto, where there was this firewall between developed countries and developing countries. And um, you know, in the, um, the, the UNFCCC process, uh, historically only developed countries have been required to commit to legally binding action to reduce emissions. Uh, because we are responsible in the developing world for the uh, the developed world, um, the majority of the historic emissions in the atmosphere. 
After Kyoto, we saw a real shift away from um, that historic model and a really breaking down of um, the firewall between developed and developing countries. The United States, when the Kyoto Protocol, uh, after it was negotiated and came back for ratification, the Senate said, absolutely not. We're not going to commit the United States to a treaty um, that does not require emission reductions from all major emitters. And so that kind of, uh, over time, uh, brought us back to the, the drawing board. And now we've really seen a shift in that process as we head toward Paris. We're no longer talking about legally binding commitments only for the industrialized world. Uh, we're talking about uh, commitments that are legally going to be legally binding at the national level, maybe not the international level, for all major economies. So that's a big shift, I think, in the debate. And I think one reason why the, the UN process holds more promise now than it has in the past. OK, thank you. Well, now, as promised, we'd like to bring you into the conversation. So um, we have a microphone over there. Uh, we ask that you ask a question or, or if you have a brief comment, but that way we can hear from more people and get more of a response. So I think we've got a lot of material now to work with uh, in terms of what's going on, what the uh, strengths and limits of, of the past agreements were, what some of the options are from here. So we will um, hear your questions. So while both arms control and climate policy could save the world, one difference between the two, I think, is the role for the private sphere. And I was hoping all three of you could speak about the future of interactions between the private and the public sphere in Miss Bell's buckshot. <laughs> Do you want me to start? Go ahead, Kathy. Sure. Go right ahead. Um, well, I think that's a great um, question. And absolutely, we need to engage the private sector um, in, uh, in the conversation. And, you know, the private sector has actually already um, stepped up. The Secretary General, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, hosted a, a large climate summit in New York last September. Uh, it gathered, you know, a huge amount of public attention. Um, there were hundreds of thousands of people that marched in the streets and simultaneous um, demonstration uh, and, and marches around the globe to really you know, draw attention to the need to act on climate change. And as part of that process, um, you know, countries and companies came forward with commitments to uh, take action on climate change, um, to reduce emissions, to make um, more uh, low carbon investments. And I think we need to continue that type of engagement uh, with the private sector. And I, I think especially on the heels of the the Paris climate negotiations, where we're likely to achieve uh, a lot, um, but there's still going to be a, a lot more work to be done to really uh, address the impacts of climate change. And I was at a, a panel discussion today at the the House of Sweden, hosted by the the Swedish Embassy, and there was a gentleman on the panel um, from uh, Volvo talking about um, how reducing climate, uh, addressing climate change, and reducing emissions is you know a key aspect of corporate strategy and I think many other companies are really seeing um, that it's important to their bottom line um, and to you know win the support of their consumers to really be progressive on climate change. Uh, I had a similar conversation with um, Coca-Cola um, last week. Or they're doing really innovative things on water, water conservation because water is a huge component of um, their product. And um, so they see the, the effects of climate change on their, their supply chain and, and they need to respond. So uh, I think you know, you're absolutely right. We need to be engaging the, the private sector in this conversation. There are places in the world where it's safer to drink Coca-Cola than water. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think how you, I hadn't thought about this before you asked the question, but I, so I'm going to try to articulate this in a coherent way. But um, the, I think the silver buckshot connects with the business part of it because, let me go back to when Dan and I were at EPA a long time ago, okay? Um, and during the early Reagan administration, which is like probably like, you know, Oz for everybody in the room. Um, and I remember that the, the administrator who he put in and the whole tenor of it was to try to kind of um, uh, ease regulation for um, 
for business, okay? And what actually happened in that case, the way they actually carried it out, they're more successful at it these days, is they, the people who had, the, the companies who had made efforts to come into compliance and had put, put money into it and put their you know, good time into it and everything, were really outraged that their competitors, who might have been dragging their feet, were going to get off the hook. And that's what helped keep things under control. Uh, am I right about that? Absolutely. Yeah. And I remember that very vividly. And I think what the buckshot thing applies in the climate world in the sense that if you can create a lot of different spheres um, of business, of interest, of demand, and stuff like that, it, it breaks up the monolith into different pieces. And they're going to be, look at our big problem right now is the guys who have the biggest megaphones are the guys who are making the money, the most money from fossil fuels, okay? And they are not going to give up that megaphone. They're not going to give up. Uh, that's, that's what makes them powerful and rich. You know, if you can create other megaphones based on other uh, fuels and other ways of dealing with these problems, you start balancing things out a little bit. And then they have less power in this political debate. I won't go into the role of money in, in, in government these days. That's a whole separate sad discussion. But it is related. But you have to get to the point where there are a lot of megaphones, not just one megaphone. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that engaging the private sector is absolutely critical. And I, I have to say, after many years of experience at EPA, we don't do a very good job of that in this country. Mm -hmm. Um, and people often have the impression that, oh, business is against climate action. Well, if you look back to the Climate Action Partnership, um, it was calling for uh, a national cap and trade along lines of the Waxman-Markey bill. It had major firms in it as well as major environmental groups. Um, Ruth is absolutely right. I work with a lot of businesses in, in my work at EPA. I was not in the enforcement office, so they, they would talk to me about things. But, um, their view, the responsible companies want fair and effective enforcement. It's like you're all taking an exam and everybody around you is cheating yep. and you aren't. Um, yep. You don't like that. So I think this image of the, the business community sort of being anti-environment or anti-climate action is not valid across the board. There, there's lots of variation within the business community just as there's variation in any other setting. But I think we have to get a lot smarter in this country mm -hmm. at working more collaboratively with the business community. It, and I, we, we tend to fall into this us versus them. And, and I think that's mm -hmm. not advancing the, the case very well. I would like to uh, ask you to join me in thanking our speakers for their time this evening. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, DC. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.